Welcome back to Space This Week. Today's episode was sponsored by Ground News, more on them later. These videos come every Monday to keep you looped in with SpaceX Starship development, as well as all the rocket launches we saw and all the other space news happenings that I found interesting. And we once again have a packed episode with Soup Heavy Booster 11 rising from the depths of the Gulf of Mexico after its watery landing during Flight 4, and its successor, Booster 12, underwent some crazy catch testing and was finally mated with Ship 30 as SpaceX completed a full stack for Starship Integrated Flight Test 5. All that needs to happen now is wet dress rehearsal and, of course, regulatory approval. Soyuz MS-25 returned to Earth, Falcon 9 made two outings to space, China conducted three orbital launches and a not quite fully successful test of their latest Falcon 9 inspired vehicle, and much, much more. Enjoy. I want to talk about three Starship flight tests today. Flight 4, Flight 5, and Flight 6. Let's start with Flight 4, which of course launched in June of this year, and was indisputably the most successful flight test of Starship thus far, with successful hot stage and successful controlled precise landing of Booster 11 in the Gulf, and of course Ship 29 went on to survive re-entry, even if only just, itself then making a successful powered vertical landing, splashing down into the Indian Ocean, 6 kilometers off target location but otherwise all good. Why am I recapping this? Frankly, ancient test flight. Well, for the past week, the 80 meter long HOS ridge wind has been lingering above the location where Booster 11 made its water landing during the fourth integrated flight test of Starship. The speculation was obviously that it was attempting to recover the remains of the booster, and earlier today, those suspicions were confirmed after Elon posted a picture of the wreck of Booster 11 being lifted into the air after almost four months at the bottom. Some people might wonder why it's in such a ruined state, considering how it appeared to land in basically one piece during the flight. Well, I don't usually like showing leaked clips and photos unless they've been widely shared and shown on official news outlets, which is the case for this image here, showing the booster exploding after the official video cut away, either due to activation of its termination system or it simply collapsing and then exploding under the stress of falling over in the water. I think it's more likely that it's intentionally being destroyed in this picture though, to guarantee that it sank both for ITAR purposes and just general shipping safety. Do you think that SpaceX, or China or India for that matter, will attempt a similar recovery of Ship 29? I'd say that that's much more unlikely, but I'd be curious to see if any attempts are made at some stage. <laughs> Maybe even Jeff Bezos will have a go like he did with the Saturn V F1s. Blue Origin could do a bit of reverse engineering on it for Project Jarvis even. <laughs> Anyway, all jokes aside and Flight 4 out of the way, let's talk about Flight 5. This will, of course, be the first Starship mission in which SpaceX will attempt to catch Super Heavy from the air with the giant chopstick arms of the launch tower. We've seen lots of reinforcements being made to the arms in preparation for this, as well as tests with a small test article. But last week, things were ramped up a notch with the rollout of Booster 12 itself to the launch pad, whereupon it was lifted by the chopsticks pretty much to the top of the tower, something we've never seen before with the booster, which is the height at which the arms will be when the catch attempt is made. I gotta say, it looks pretty surreal seeing it so high up on the arms there. It was then laid to rest on the orbital launch mount before it was time to roll out its counterpart, Ship 30, sporting its brand new upgraded heat shield down to the launch pad to complete the Flight 5 full stack. SpaceX posted on Twitter, saying that they're now ready to launch, presumably pending wet dress rehearsal of course, and regulatory approval. Yep, the FAA are still dragging their bureaucratic heels with approving the launch license for Flight 5, which many people, including Congress members and SpaceX themselves, feel are becoming for ever more frivolous reasons. Politics and bureaucracy are an unavoidable part of spaceflight, and it's therefore inevitable that coverage of spaceflight news can be affected by underlying biases and sensationalisms, making it hard to know how reliable the reporting can be. That's what today's sponsor, Ground News, sets out to address. Ground News was created by a former NASA engineer and it aims to help you cut through political bias in news reporting by providing a visual breakdown of each story to reveal the reporting outlets, their owners, their political biases and the factual accuracy of their sources. Another great feature is their blind spot feed, which is a unique feature that shows stories overlooked by one side of the political spectrum and it surfaces 20 blind spot stories every day. Let's take a look at the recent Polaris Dawn missions reporting. Ground News' bias distribution shows that there's a 
fairly even split between left-leaning, centrist, and right-leaning news sources. You can see how each side of the spectrum is reporting on things by clicking on each of these three tabs, and for a very quick rundown, Ground News has an AI-powered bias comparison tab. Clicking this reveals that the left delivers more technical details for the mission and its importance for future Mars expeditions. Meanwhile, the center focuses on NASA's endorsement of it and the wider significance for the commercial space sector working with government entities. And the right looks more towards the political implications of the mission and the lack of recognition towards SpaceX's advancements from the current Democrat administration. Ground News's mission is something I really support, and you should too. Go to ground.news to get 40% off their unlimited access vantage plan for just five dollars per month this plan provides total access to every feature mentioned in this video and more thank you so much to ground news for sponsoring this video recently congressman kevin kiley discussed spacex on the house floor and noted that they were facing unreasonable levels of bureaucratic pushback from the faa in this case the reasons that they're being held back are completely unrelated to safety or any other legitimate public interest. In fact, the company has bent over backwards to comply with environmental regulations. There simply should not be delays related to paperwork or bureaucracy. The FAA and related agencies need to prioritize enabling launches, not standing in their way. SpaceX themselves also recently filed a letter to Congress regarding the FAA situation and how SpaceX were recently handed a fine of $633,000 for, in their eyes, no reasonable wrongdoing. The FAA alleged that SpaceX had used their new propellant farm without FAA approval, used an updated communications plan that hadn't been approved, and that they didn't conduct a launch poll two hours before a launch. To address each of these claims, SpaceX stated that the so-called communications plan change was simply them moving the location of the Launch Control Center from one location at the Kennedy Space Center to another, with no actual alteration in the communications procedures, networks, or personnel. And with regard to the assertion that they didn't conduct a T-minus two-hour readiness poll prior to their PSN MSF launch, SpaceX stated that nowhere in the regulations is a requirement for a T-minus two-hour readiness poll made. Finally, to address the new RP-1 fuel farm, the farm in question is the new one at Launch Complex 39A. The farm was basically moved to be over twice the distance from the nearest publicly accessible area outside the fence line, therefore making it safer than the old one. Furthermore, it was approved by the range safety officers and the FAA approved the use of the farm for Crew 7 in the form of a waiver, but needed more time to approve it for every other launch. SpaceX are therefore questioning why the FAA would determine the farm safe for Crew 7, but not the Echo Star Jupiter 3 launch, which is the launch that they are being fined over. So ironically, the FAA deemed the new farm safe for a crew launch, but not an uncrewed one. Now, this was very much a TLDR summary of the whole letter, and I'm obviously not able to include every single detail, so I will link the full thing in the description below if you want to read it yourself. Now, this letter obviously isn't directly pertaining to Starship operations, but SpaceX haven't held back in expressing frustration about FAA delays to Flight 5 either, stating that they are finding themselves delayed for unreasonable and exasperating reasons given the recent 60-day delay to Flight 5 imposed by the FAA due to, in part, the fact that the hot stage ring of Booster 12 is going to splash down in a different location in the ocean compared to Booster 11, which apparently requires a two-month consultation with the National Marine Fisheries Service. Anyway, all that aside, the reason for the full stack of Booster 12 and Ship 30 might be to encourage some more pressure on regulators, but also to begin testing of the vehicle. At the time of me writing this video's script, so like today, a few hours before you watch this, testing had begun. It looks like some standard cryo testing here with presumably wet dress rehearsal to follow. Probably more will be known by the time this video is published, so maybe you can let me know in the comments below. <laughs> Anyway, I said at the beginning of this video that I had things to discuss with Flight 4, 5, and 6, just because it sounded nice, I guess. No actual news regarding the actual 6th flight, but we've seen some new tests with Flight 6's Starship. Last week, Ship 31 conducted a 6-engine static fire test of its Raptor engines at the Massey's test site, and with no evidence to the contrary, this was a success, hopefully meaning that there isn't much time between Flight 5 and Flight 6, assuming that the FAA doesn't want more delays and that the tower is isn't destroyed or severely damaged in a botched attempt of a booster catch. Time will tell. We had several orbital launches over the course of the week, let's cover those, starting with SpaceX's ever-reliable Falcon 9, which had two outings. 
the first of which was on Tuesday when Falcon lifted off from Cape Canaveral Launch Pad 40, carrying two European Galileo satellites to medium Earth orbit. Galileo is basically a European version of America's global positioning system, better known as just GPS, and are obviously used for navigation, and exists so that European political and military entities don't have to rely on the US GPS or the Russian GLONASS satellite navigation systems. The way this mission ended up going to Falcon 9 is kind of interesting. It was originally going to launch on a Soyuz STB, but the war in Ukraine saw an end to ESA's partnership with Roscosmos, and the launch was therefore moved to Ariane 6. But thanks to delays with this rocket, SpaceX was given the contract to launch two pairs of Galileo satellites on Falcon, and last week's mission was the second and final of these launches. The rocket's first stage made its 22nd lifetime landing, touching down on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. The other Falcon 9 launch of the week was a fairly standard Starlink mission on Friday, launching 20 new Starlink satellites from Vandenberg, and the Falcon 9's first stage got its 13th total landing out the way, landing on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship in the Pacific Ocean. Going back to the Galileo launch, that wasn't the only orbital mission we saw that day. Over in Russia, a Russian Angaria launched two secretive reconnaissance satellites from the Blasetska launch site. Not a lot of further information has been disclosed about this mission, so not really much more for me to talk about there. The next day, over at New Zealand's Mahia Peninsula, Rocket Lab was primed to launch an Electron with five Kinase nanosatellites on board. On the mission dubbed Kinase Killed the Radio Star. Uh, the name of the mission is on screen. The Radiot is spelled that way because the Kinase Satellite Constellation is an Internet of Things constellation. Just, just really awful. And as punishment for this, the rocket refused to launch, and we saw an abort of the mission. The next attempt made by Rocket Lab was on Friday, and this time they were met with success, and all five satellites reached their target orbits, completing the second of five dedicated launches with five Kinase Internet of Things satellites on board. Last week also saw three orbital launches of three different Chinese rockets. Let's go over those in chronological order. The first was on Thursday, this was a Long March 3BE, carrying three Beidou navigation satellites to low Earth orbit. Kind of funny timing that we're seeing this launching within days of a European Galileo satellite launch, since the Beidou series are very similar to Galileo, GPS and GLONASS. The following day saw a Long March 2D from Taiwan, carrying an Earth observation satellite to low Earth orbit. As for the satellite's purpose, official sources have stated that it's the first satellite of Gansu's first commercial satellite constellation, Chilean series, developed for Gansu's ecological protection and economic development, and that it's the first ultra-large-width, high-resolution optical remote sensing satellite developed in small batches in China. Another rocket launched from China later that day, this time a Kwaizu 1A which carried four Internet of Things Tianqi satellites to low Earth orbit, which official sources have stated have all entered their target orbit successfully and are now an operational part of the Tianqi satellite constellation. China is still working on getting a Falcon 9 competitor operational. Now in last week's episode of Space This Week, I covered the latest land space Zuche 3 high altitude hop test, and this week I have Deep Blue's latest test of its Nebula 1 test vehicle. The hop test went pretty well, but the ending, not so much. Powered by three Thunder R1 engines, the vehicle achieved hover above its landing site, something Falcon 9 isn't actually capable of, but then it sort of just dropped down, bringing the test to an unfortunately explosive end. Still, it was a cracking effort by Deep Blue, and I'm honestly surprised that almost 10 years on from SpaceX sticking the first Falcon 9 landing, nobody else is reusing first stages yet. The International Space Station's crew roster is three short after the departure of the Soyuz MS-25 spacecraft, returning three crew members back to Earth. They were cosmonauts Oleg Kononenko and Nikolai Chubb, and NASA astronaut Tracy Dyson. The two cosmonauts have actually spent about a year in space, arriving at the station in September 2023 on board Soyuz MS-24. The landing of the capsule here may look a little bit violent, but that's only because the capsule fires two soft landing engines about two seconds before touchdown to provide a final braking maneuver to keep the landing as gentle as possible. Crew egress of the capsule occurred earlier today. Laon Aerospace was back in action last Saturday as I conducted a very stressful tuna mission. And it was stressful because I did it with live commentary, with no quick loading and no cuts. 
And I had a lot of pretty good feedback in the comments saying that people really enjoyed seeing a slightly more how I actually fly mission sort of perspective. So if it sounds like a good watch that should now be one of the clickable cards on screen. Also, once again, big thanks to Ground News for sponsoring today. Go to ground.news slash map lounge, check them out. And a final massive, massive thank you to all the names on the right, my Patreon and YouTube channel members who help make all of this content possible. 